market power, about it being costly to engage in the market process, and therefore it would be much better uh, to just centralize everything. Um, and uh, Therefore, for socialism can implement the true market al allocation much better than the market ever can. Yes, Steve. Um, how does this address the problem of competition? Well, but you don't need competition. I mean, we just we just take everybody's. How do we have any innovation if there's no competition? Exactly. So that's all the imperfections. That, that's all the that's all the imperfections things that we were talking about. That's the idea that there's someone out there who has an idea that's not available to the central planner that he knows himself and we need to give him rewards for that. But what if the central planner had access to everything that was in everyone's minds? It could just figure out what would be the optimal thing for that person to be working on. What's the, what's the incentive to then work on and find a innovation? Okay. Yeah, well, but you could, the, the, the central planner could just direct you to work on that if he, they knew all the ideas that were available in your mind. So why would you do that? The central planner would be yeah, because the central planner would give you more, would, well, no, no, but but the but like the point is that any we wouldn't have to dull your incentive to do that at all, because we would know already all your potential for coming up with innovations. We would charge you a tax based on that. Right? Well, that's sort of the next thing that I was about to talk about. So, it, imagine the central planner is still giving you incentives. How much you get allocated increases as you do more work for it. But I'm going to even get around that in a second. So, uh, the 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 second welfare theorem um, says that uh, we can redistribute in ways that are not costly, and we shouldn't use distortions to redistribute. But that exactly addresses Stieg's problem. Stieg's problem was, well, you know, if we start just redistributing everything and whatever, no one's going to have any incentive to work, right? But what the, the second welfare theorem really says is, no, Stieg's wrong. We can redistribute everyone because we can observe all the potential income they'll ever earn in their life based on their inherent abilities, which we can see from their genetic code and their, uh, you know, and, and everything we understand about the circumstances they're in. We'll charge them a tax bill based on that. And then, yeah, they can go and do whatever they want from then on or be assigned by the system whatever they want from then on. But we've just taken away and given them uh, the true distribution that they get and the, the amount that they have to work. And they've got to do that because we already know exactly what they're capable of and all that, all that stuff. I mean, that's really what the second welfare theorem says. It says there's no cost redistribution. There's no need uh, to distort anything. We should just redistribute and make everyone perfectly equal, which we could do if we knew all their potential ability, right? So the welfare theorems do not favor capitalism or the market. I think, if anything, the opposite. Most of the things we usually associate with the market, firms having market power, innovating independently. All those things don't happen in the theorems. And, and you know, inequality arising because of that and so forth, right? So if not this, then what actually is good about markets? So the famous answer was given by von Mises and, and Hayek, and they said that the planner, in order to make these decisions, needs to know everything that's inside of everyone's mind. And how the heck would we get all these information without um, without having access to uh, prices. Um, imagine that you tried to build a railroad. And you're trying to decide, should I go through the mountain? Uh, should I go around the mountain? Or should I tunnel through the mountain? Right? Um, on the one hand, you might save labor by going around the mountain because it's more work to tunnel through. But you might also have a longer trip. And the question is, how do you value those things relative to each other? Well, you need to know the price of each of them. And how do you figure out that price uh, with, with, without uh, things? Well, the answer is that all that the market's doing in determining that price is aggregating a bunch of people's information. If we had all that information, we could, could just compute what the price was. But the idea is that by allowing people to be entrepreneurs, by allowing people to earn rents in various different ways in the economy, we get people to incorporate their information, which otherwise they wouldn't tell the system. Right? OK. Um, and so fundamentally, the market, with all of its inefficiencies, is an information aggregator. It's delegating to people the responsibility of uh, figuring out certain things. So the classic uh, story about this is that no one in the economy knows how to make a pencil. 
right? There might be someone who knows how to grind the graphite. There might be someone who knows how to mine the graphite. There might be someone who knows how to uh, cut down the tree and other people who know how to turn the tree into planks and other people who know how to laminate, but no one knows how to make the whole pencil, right? And the second welfare theorem is even more socialistic. It says we don't need to tolerate any inequality. Just redistribute from those with high potential income to those with low potential income uh, and demand from everyone uh, whatever labor you need from them. That's what the second welfare theorem says. That's what I would call from each according to his ability to each according to his need, right? So uh, that sounds pretty socialistic to me. The problem is in practice we don't know how much people's potential income is. Instead we observe their actual income. Um, and uh, the problem is would you really want to make someone pay what their potential income is? Are you that confident that you know what it is? So imagine that there was someone who was very able and that they just wanted to be a bum for the rest of their lives. Chrissy, uh, what would have to happen if we wanted to implement the second welfare theorem and there was someone like that? So if the person were able, you would, and you were being sort of centralized economy, you would go or to Not even, just think about the second welfare theorem. Let's forget about whether it's centralized or decentralized. Imagine we wanted to charge them a bunch of money based on their potential income, but they didn't want to pay that. If we really wanted to enforce that, what would we have to do? Yeah, we'd have to subject them to forced labor camps, which is basically communism. So if you actually think about what would it take to implement the second welfare theorem, it's exactly what the Soviet Union did. It's if someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do, you send them into a forced labor camp, right? So this, and not anything pro-market, is the message of the second welfare theorem, right? Um, again, it's the lack of information that limits this redistribution. If we knew that that person's preference was to be a bum, we could either say, well, look, they don't get to do that. They don't afford, they shouldn't be able to afford to waste their labor like that. Or if it's just that they're not actually as able as we thought, we would already know that, right? So inequity is really what we accept as a market failure to deal with the fact that we don't know everyone's potential income. Okay. So if the main, um, if, if market failures are the cost of market, delegation is the benefit. Individuals um, have information the government doesn't, then there's a value in allowing the market to function despite all of its problems. Um, and many trade-offs that show up in economics um, are precisely uh, having to do with this delegation of information uh, and putting up with market failures in exchange uh, for the value of incorporating information. So, Eric, how about in the trade-off of optimal redistribution? You took my class last year. What is the trade-off there about information? We were just talking about it that ends up getting reflected in the debate between socialism and capitalism. Yeah, well, so I guess what I'm getting at is that, um, is, that if we, is that if we redistribute less, we get more efficiency. If we redistribute more, and, that, and we get more efficiency because basically we're allowing people's uh, inherent abilities to shine through more because we can't perfectly observe them, right? If we just redistribute more, we get to deal with the inequities that come along with the market, right? right? Um, if we knew everyone's potential income, if information was perfect, we wouldn't face that trade-off, right? Similarly, you know, if we think about when uh, does regulation of a market make sense? Neil, how, how do you think that this could play out when we think about issues of regulating companies? Like imagine like regulating their prices down to cost. Like why, you know, we know that it's inefficient for prices to be above cost. Why don't we reg just regulate every company's prices down to cost? Um, we wouldn't have a lot of incentives for us to do business. Uh, and, and so if we, if we force them all to do that, no one would start new companies, no one would, you know, and they get new products. Yeah, but what if we knew about all the uh, possibilities they have to create new companies? 
right? Then we could just tell them to create a new company, right? We wouldn't have to give them profits in this inefficient way. Well, they would, uh, we would say, look, you, you, we know that you have the ability to start a company. You have to start this company or you go to forced labor camp, right? So they would all start the company and we would know perfectly. Now, that might sound funny because if we end up sending anyone to forced labor camp in equilibrium, obviously that's not very efficient. But if we knew exactly uh, what their capabilities are, they all would start the company in equilibrium, right? So the imperfections in regulation is that if we have more regulation, we do less to take advantage of people's private information about what companies they can start. But on the other hand, we get more efficiency after the fact, right? And that's similar to the trade-off between patents and prizes. If we give prizes to people, we don't have to deal with the fact that patents raise prices above cost. But on the other hand, um, we uh, have to know what the value of every product is rather than let the market tell that to us. And that's a cost of using a prize, right? Um, another question is, you know, two different um, uh, ways uh, we can think about, um, well, imagine that we have the problem, is David Mallison here? He's dropped the course. Dropped the course. Um, so we, we can think about how much information should we give to consumers about product? Or how much information should we get from consumers? Um, on the one hand, we could, rather than giving consumers a giant document that says all the details of the investments that they're about to make, we could just say, this is a good investment or this is a bad investment, right? Now, the second way is a lot easier for consumers to deal with. But if consumers are very heterogeneous, they don't want to just know if for the average person this is good or bad. They want to know for them specifically is this good or bad. They want something that's really tailored to them. But on the other hand, it's really hard for them to interact and confusing for them to interact with something that's very complicated. Or in Mohammed's example, you know, how much information do I get from consumers? Do I ask them to fill out some really long, complicated thing to make sure I fit their heterogeneity perfectly? Or do I do something that's very coarse and is really simple and easy for them to interact with, right? Um, it all depends on how heterogeneous people are, how much private information they have about what's uh, good for them. So um, market distortions, these costs, imply that centralization is going to be better absent information. And therefore, capitalism is justified by the lack of ability to get enough information or have computational capacity in a centralized way. So what um, is going to happen as uh, information technology improves, as the ability to process information gets better, well, in the internet age, this local information is gradually uh, retreating. Most knowledge that consumers use anyways is on the internet. And while we're not completely there already, we're going to increasingly be moving in that direction. Um, the data sources are just unbelievable that are available and increasingly becoming more available that are going to allow much, much better uh, solutions to these problems and much more value to centralization because the inefficiencies that come with decentralization will increasingly go away. So I think this is going to increasingly erode the case for capitalist institutions. Decision engines are increasingly making choices for us. The cases, um, if um, Apple can rather than seeing how much you're willing to pay for a product, figure out how much value you get out of it simply by um, seeing how often you use it, how much you interact with it, how much you talk on Facebook about how much you like it, then they can reward the companies based on that rather than making you pay a price for it. And then they can just costlessly bundle everything in to uh, the iPhone, which will make your experience much easier and reduce the amount by which people don't use apps just because there's a high price for them or the amount which they have to carry advertisements which are annoying to consumers. The more we're able to monitor people's income, the more we know what people's ability is,